You know, it's my prayer as the lead pastor of this church that, that everything that we do, from the singing to the preaching to the connecting to the everything, the goal is to bring you nearer to the heart of God. You know, God has made that invitation clear to us, but sometimes we have a heart of stone that refuses to come to the heart of God. And so it's my prayer now that as we get ready to hear the word for today, the, the word that God has prepared for you, that we would be ready to receive it. So I want to invite you to pow, uh, pause with me and bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we know that before the world began, you already prepared this word for us today. So my simple prayer now is that you would get this preacher out of the way that those who are in the hearing of my voice would hear the whisper of your spirit now. Nearer to your heart we ask to go. In the loving name of Jesus we pray, amen. You know, I just wanted to give you a quick, um, uh, a little tidbit. If, you know, today we had, um, we don't have Disciple Town, which is our kids' Sabbath school because uh, a couple of the teachers who, were either supposed to be here or couldn't be here, and so we couldn't have Disciple Town today. So if you're a parent that has a child and at some point in the sermon, I, you know, they get a little bored of hearing me and they get a little restless, we, we do want to invite you to take use of our family room. It's down the hall. It's past the men's restroom. And uh, it's a room that has been created specifically for you and your family in those moments because we know sometimes it's hard um, for our children. And so we just want to make sure that you have that option. You know that it is there for you. There is a live stream of the service, so you won't miss one single beat. And so we just want to provide that space for you today. But today I'm going to continue in our little mini sermon series. You know, when we started this little mini series, it wasn't really intentionally supposed to go for three weeks. When we knew that we were baptizing someone last Sabbath, we said, well, let's have a sermon on baptism and being born again. And, and what does it mean that salvation is there for every single one of us? So we started in John chapter 3, and, and the way that my brain works, if you know the Myers-Briggs, I am an introvert, which means that I process things quietly on my own. And what God often does is he'll give me not just one sermon, but two sermons and three sermons and pretty soon we have a whole sermon series because the Spirit says there's more that I want you to know. And so what we've done is as we're going through the book of John chapter 3, really with the goal of asking, what does it mean when Jesus says that we must be born again? How do we get born again? And what does it look like for us to live as people who have been born again? You know, for a lot of us, if you grew up in the Seventh-day Adventist church, we don't talk about being born again. Right, like if I ask this question, when were you born again? Do you have an answer for that? For a lot of people, we don't. What we do have is the date of when we were baptized, but not always when we were reborn from above. And I felt like, you know what? We need to have this conversation. We, we need to go deeper in our theology. Amen? I'm gonna need you to talk to me. My, uh, the app on my phone says that I should consider resting today because I was only able to physically recover up to 11%, which means that my body is tired, fam. Uh, I went to the gym yesterday. I worked out hard. Uh, this morning as part of my preparation. I put in a few miles this morning as I'm kind of going over my sermon. Your pastor's running the Chicago Marathon in two weeks. Yes. By God's grace. I've been training, but my, my, I have an app that tells me when I have to rest. And I'll be honest, if, I list, if we listen to all of the voices that are telling us things, sometimes we wouldn't pursue the things that God is asking us to do. Because my app has told me that I'm tired every single day this week. <laughs> but I still had to train. But see, that's what happens a lot of times in our lives. We, we fall for the voices that are loudest in our lives when what we need to be doing is paying attention to what God is whispering in our ear. And I love that song, Nearer to the Heart of God, because the closer we are to God, the lighter the whisper. You see, God whispers because he is close to us. 
In John chapter three, we see the story of a man who wants to hear what God has to say to him, but he's blind and he's deaf. And some biblical scholars would say that he was really dead. So there's a story in John chapter three about a man named Nicodemus. So if you weren't here last week, I'm gonna go through this in about 30 seconds. There was a man named Nicodemus who was a Pharisee. The Bible tells us that he wasn't just a Pharisee who was a very religious man, a man that people would look to and say, you know, little baby DQ, when you grow up, I want you to be like that man Nicodemus because he is a man of power. He was a man of influence. He was a man that people from the church would go to and say, Nicodemus, We've been reading this thing in scripture and we don't quite understand. Can you explain it to us? And Nicodemus would open up his scroll and then he would teach the people what the scripture said. Nicodemus was a man of importance. But the Bible tells us that there comes a day when Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night and Nicodemus says, Jesus, we've seen the miracles that you've been doing. Now remember, Nicodemus as a Pharisee, his arch enemy, his nemesis was Jesus. Because the Pharisees were the religious order of the day. And Jesus comes in and he starts challenging all these teachings. And so Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night and he says, Jesus, we've seen what you've done. We've seen you heal people. We've seen you turn water into wine. We have seen you do miraculous things. You must have the power of God with you. And I love, I love how Jesus can see into his heart. You see, Jesus sees into the heart of Nicodemus and he knew that Nicodemus had gone to church his whole life. Nicodemus had dressed the right way to go to church. Nicodemus was giving his offering, his tithe and his offering he would give to the poor. Nicodemus did all of the right things. People would look to him and say, look at how righteous and holy Nicodemus is. But when Nicodemus comes to Jesus, Jesus is able to see what was going on on the inside. You see, sometimes we think that we can hide what's going on on the inside by how we look and act on the outside. But Jesus always can see what's happening in your heart. So Jesus looks at Nicodemus. And instead of addressing like, yeah, Nicodemus, I'm obviously the son of God. I came from heaven. The reason that I can turn water into wine or I can heal the blind or I can heal the crippled is because I am God. I'm the son of God. But Jesus doesn't do that. Nicodemus, in his seeking, in his searching, in his hunger for something deeper than religion could offer him, Jesus goes right for the meat. Jesus says in John chapter 3, John chapter 3, verse 5, he says, Truly I tell you that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Nicodemus was a seeker. Now, in the church world today, and Pastor Dave, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to share some bomb, a truth bomb with you right now. You know, whenever we think of churches, oftentimes we think that when someone is seeking truth, they come to the church. And a lot of times what we do as churches, Pastor Dave, a lot of times what we do with churches is if someone is seeking, then we try to be super gentle with them. And we try to hold their hand through the entire process But the way of Jesus was like, no, Jesus challenged them as hard as he could possibly challenge them. And it got me thinking. I was sitting at my my desk in my study last night at home. It was about 11 o'clock. I was just looking over the sermon. The sermon was already written, all right? It was written last week. But I was just letting it pour over me. And Jesus challenged Nicodemus. He didn't beat around the bush. Because Jesus knew that what was at stake was Nicodemus' eternal salvation. So Jesus says, look, Nicodemus, I know you're here. You know all the right answers. Amen, a Seventh-day Adventist church. We know all the right answers. We come to church every single Sabbath. We sing the right songs. We dress the right way. We know the right Bible verses and the right prayers. And, you know, I remember growing up, and I was probably in, in the sixth grade. And I remember going to the church every single Sabbath, Every single week, we read the Sabbath school lesson. My mom and dad, are grateful for this, instilled in me from a very young age that before I could turn the television on in the morning, I had to read my Sabbath school lesson. Amen? Man, that was like a whole lifetime of, like, guilt. 
So I couldn't turn the television on before school unless I read my Sabbath school lesson. But guess what? I would read that Sabbath school lesson every day. I would read my Bible as a kid. I would memorize my memory verses. How many of us still remember memory verses? I would memorize those things because every week, the teacher would give me a little sticker and it would go on my chart on that wall. And every week, if you, by the end of the year, if you got stickers for every single memory verse, then you would get a Bible. And I was like, I, I want that Bible. And it, I still have it. It's at my parents' house. They haven't given it to me yet, but it, it's mine, but it's still at my parents' house. It's on that shelf. It's weathered. It's worn. And it's like a picture of Jesus with either his disciples or, or kids. I can't remember. It's been years since I've actually looked at it. But you know, we grew up doing all the right things, knowing all the right things, keeping the Sabbath so holy and pure because we believe that by doing all of these things, that like we would assure us of our salvation. Like, can I just be honest with you? That's why we did it. No one would say it, but that's why we did it, out of guilt. But Jesus, he's like, if you want to see the kingdom, Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you've done all the right things. You've memorized your Bible verses. You got that special Bible at the end of the day. But Nicodemus, you're still missing the most important part. You see, three times in the book of John, Nicodemus will ask, how can I be reborn again, Jesus? How, I can't enter into my mother's womb. How is this even possible, Jesus? And that's the answer we're gonna, that's the question we're gonna answer today. But Nicodemus was asking how, when the right question to ask was, who can make me born again? Now, let me, let me just, I want, to sh I, want to sh I want you to hear my heart. There is nothing wrong with seeking righteousness. It is a good endeavor for us to read our Bibles every day. It is a good endeavor for us to give our tithes and our offering. It is a good endeavor for us to hold Sabbath sacred and holy. Those are all wonderful things. but they only count if you're doing them out of love for a Jesus who has already paid the price for your salvation. But if you're doing it out of guilt, like I did when I was a kid, I couldn't turn the television on until I read my Sabbath school quarterly, you're gonna miss out on what God has in store for you. We do what we do out of love and gratefulness for the fact that Jesus has paid the price. The price of your salvation was Jesus' death on the cross. And there is nothing in this world, no depths of hell, that can reverse the death of Jesus' death on that cross. There is nothing. The Bible says that there is nothing that you can do that can separate you from the love of who? From the love of God. There is nothing. That thing you did that still brings you shame cannot separate you from the love of God. Those words that you said that you wish you could take back cannot separate you from the love of God. There is nothing that you can do that can make God love you any less. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone loves you, they will not see you suffer in an eternal hell. I am a parent. I love my daughter. Just Two daughters. I love my daughters. <laughs> One of them is too little still, so she doesn't do anything wrong. Like, she barely crawls around. I love my daughters, and I grew up in a home, and this is not in my notes, so by God's grace, God, let me make sure I say all the words right, because in first service, I said a lot of wrong things. <laughs> it's not online. You're never going to see it. Um, growing up, Growing up, I um, growing up, I grew up in a Mexican household. So I'm Mexican. Some of you are asking. Some of you thought I was Indian or um, Pakistani or something else. I, I got Italian sometimes when I worked at Olive Garden. People thought I was Italian. No, Mexican. My parents were born in Mexico, and um, I grew up in a Mexican household where cleanliness was next to godliness. Like I would eat. Uh, I, I wouldn't. I, like, I would have eaten off of the floors in my mom's house, but still to this day. It is, there is never trash in a trash can in my mother's house to this day. Everything is spick and span clean. So I grew up in a system where everything was always having to be clean. I grew up in a house where everything had to be clean, and I, I, I have carried that over in my life to the age of 40, almost 42 where I'm at today. 
Why am I telling you guys this? Here's why. Because there have been times when I come home and my daughter, eldest daughter, has been in my office and my desk has all of her papers of the drawings and writings that she has done. And there sometimes are toys on the floor in my office and I come in there to put my stuff down and I'm just like, Everly, I need you to come clean up my office. Like, this is my place of peace. <laughs> I would say it a lot meaner. And repeatedly. But here's what happens. For a while there, my daughter thought that my love was contingent to how well she could keep my office clean. This is not pastoral sermonic hyperbole. This is the truth that I was living. I have had to repair that every single day. To tell her there is no amount of mess could make me love you any less. I've had to ask God to transform me so that even when I get home and my office, she has been there, I remind myself, it, it reminds me that she is alive and she is healthy and I will take this mess every day over being and having a clean house. And I will have to repair this every day for the rest of my life. And I've had to remind her that there is nothing she can do that can make me love her less. Amen. Jesus says there is nothing you can do that will ever make him stop loving you. Amen. You can't cheat on him. You can't bad talk him enough. You can't do any sin that is going to make him love you any less. So as followers of Jesus, we seek righteousness. As followers of Jesus, we do what we can every single day to live more and more like Jesus. That is 100% true, but we do it because we want that relationship with him. Jesus tells Nicodemus, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, if you want to see the kingdom of God, you must be born of water and spirit. Jesus goes in to explain what it looks like to be born again. And I think as Seventh-day Adventist, we need to do a better job. We need to do the best job of all the other faiths to explain what being born again is. We don't talk about it. We go straight to John 3.16. And guess what? We're not even going to get there today. That's next week at 10.30 online only because it serves Sabbath. But we'll talk about that later. But Jesus says you need to be born of water and of spirit. And, and we can go into what that means. But where I want to go is I want to draw your attention to the book of Ezekiel chapter 36. You know, one of the things that we're going to be shifting a little bit here at Bolingbroke Church, at least when I'm on the stage here, is that we're going to focus on going deeper. Is that all right? Amen? Amen. You know, a lot of times, if, you, if you're starting a business, for those of you who are business owners, if you're selling a course online, anything like that, people will always say, you have to define your ideal audience and then find your pain point. Marketing, Joel, right? Find your pain point and then sell to that. I think as churches, we have often started with that premise in our preaching what is your pain point? Let me give you a Bible verse for it. But what is better is for us to build a deeper, more solid theology so that when the highs and lows of life come your way, you always know what your foundation is. So we're going to go a little deeper, amen? Is that okay? Like, love it or hate it, but that's where we're going. I mean, you can vote me out. You can vote me out, I suppose, but I won't go without a fight. So what does it mean to be born of water and spirit? Nicodemus would have known what I, the, the prophet Ezekiel said in Ezekiel chapter 36. The Bible says in verse 24, I will take you out of the nations and I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back to your own land. The Israelites had been conquered by foreign powers. God, uh, these foreign powers literally took the children of Israel and sent them throughout all of the region so that the Israelites could not revolt against the empire. So these people, imagine someone comes into the house that you have been paying faithfully every single month for 29 years. And you can see that one more year and the house is yours. The taxes you still have to pay, but the house is yours. Imagine somebody comes and tears you from your house and takes you to live in, what's colder than Illinois? Wisconsin? Minnesota. Minnesota. Yeah, imagine that, living in Minnesota. 
Imagine someone comes and takes you from your house and sends you away. Imagine they take you away from your family if you're, a, if you're a, a young man that can probably lift up arms and they take you from your mother and your father and your siblings because they want to get you as far away from each other as possible so that you cannot revolt against the empire. And God brings a word and he says, Israelites, I know that you have been dispersed throughout all of the regions. I know that you've given up hope. I know that when you look at the life that you're living, things seem like there is no hope and things are impossible and you're never gonna know how you're gonna pay that debt or you don't know how you're gonna get that job or you don't know how your marriage is ever gonna be healed and you're looking at your life and you're just like, man, I have lost hope. I am alone, I am depressed, I am angry and there is no help. And God comes to Ezekiel and he says, I have a message for those who feel this way. Verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean water. I will cleanse you from all your impurities, from all your idols. Verse 26, and I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Watch this. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees so that you are careful to follow my laws. God says, Jesus says that you must be born of water and of spirit. And he was referring back to the book of Ezekiel where God says, I will cleanse you. I will cleanse you with my water and I will put a new spirit within you. So who does the work of being born again? God does. There is no formula to follow. There is no righteousness that you could be good enough in order to gain this. No, God does all of the work. When Jesus dies on the cross, did Jesus ask you if he should die to forgive you of your sins? Jesus does it. That's the gift of, like, that's what I love about the Christian faith. We are the only faith that preaches a message of grace. We're the only ones. You don't have to earn your own salvation. We're the only ones that God does the work of salvation for us. How you live your life now is lived as a life of worship. So the reason that we seek righteousness and goodness is because we want to live our very best for the God who has given us eternal life. And so Jesus, quoting the book of Ezekiel, he says, I will put a new heart in you and I will turn your heart of stone into a heart of flesh which means that God says, I will make you the person that I always desired for you to be. That comes from God. That's the gift. What does it look like to be born again? Is to come to the one, to the who, who can have the power over your life to transform you. Nicodemus was asking how, and, and we ask how. I can't tell you how many courses I've purchased online about how to do things in my life. I can't tell you how many YouTube videos I have looked at about how to repair things in my house. I, how many, am I alone? You go to YouTube and you look at the videos. How many of you done that? To repair your house? And then when I get to the end of the video, I'm like, yeah, I can't do that. Like, I need to call someone. <laughs> Bust the credit card out because this is going to cost us. It's the same thing with your life of faith. You can't earn your salvation. You can't earn your good enoughness. You cannot make yourself be born. Again, it comes from the power of the one who already paid the price for your salvation. Being born again is simply you turning to the one who has the power to do that. And so in John chapter 3, verse 5, I'm sorry, verse 7, Jesus says this to the religious leader Nicodemus. He says, you shouldn't be surprised at my saying this, that you should be born again. So he must have had an understanding of what that already began to mean. And then in verse 8, he says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. Now, the word wind in the Greek, this word is pneuma, which can either mean wind or the Spirit of God. So he says, the Spirit of God can blow wherever it pleases. You hear it sound. But you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going so it is with everyone that is born of the Spirit. And what that means is that we don't know how it happens. And we can't even point out to when it's going to happen. All we know is that if we submit our lives to Jesus daily, God will begin to change things in our lives. A lot of times as Christians, what we do is we try to modify our behavior. Well, I have this sin in my life, so I need to cut this sin out. 
or I have this thing that I'm doing in my life, this area in my life that I've hardened my heart towards, and I need to start to modify my behavior so that God can still give me favor and love. And what happens in this world is we try to modify our behavior, but what we need is heart transformation. And that only comes from you showing up to the presence of Jesus. So I'm gonna read a passage, um, not a passage, I'm gonna read an excerpt from the book Desire of Ages that I read last week and, and I've just been, it's been bringing me back. And so I just, I want you to listen, close your eyes if you need to. I didn't give it to the media team, so I want you to listen. In this book, she's talking about how the work of the Spirit, how it works out in our lives. And it says, by an agency unseen as the wind, Christ is constantly working upon the heart. Little by little, perhaps unconsciously to you, impressions are made that tend to draw the soul to Christ. They may be received through meditating upon him, through reading the scriptures, or through hearing the word from the living preacher. And then suddenly, as the Spirit comes with a more direct appeal, your soul gladly surrenders to Jesus. By many, this is called a sudden conversion. But it is the result of a long wooing by the Spirit of God. A long wooing of the Spirit of God. You know, Jesus says that those who are born of the flesh are born of the flesh, but those who are born of the Spirit are born into the Spirit. And what Jesus is saying is, listen, your birth mother held you in the stomach for almost nine months. Some of you are a little bit less. Pastor Dave was less. How many months, Dave? Six? Seven months? Seven months? No, I'm not joking. I'm saying like... That's right. But your birth mother carried you in her womb for nine months. She nourished you. She fed you. She protected you. And so as she gestated you in her womb, she was preparing you for life. Everything that has happened in your life up to this very moment as you hear my words, the Spirit of God has been gestating you, has been getting you ready, has been wooing you to remind you to turn back to Him. Now, I know, I know, I know, I know. Some of you are saying, Pastor, I'm already saved. You just you said we're saved. You said we're in, we're good, we don't have to do anything. But the reality of this is, is that for us to, and you're right, nothing can separate you from the love of God, Jesus. Nothing undoes the death of Jesus on the cross over your life. That, that you're justified before the Father. But the way that you live as though you are saved is about learning to daily surrender to the whispers of the Spirit in your life. So let me give you an example. I got a couple minutes left. Let me give you an example of what this looks like. So growing up, my parents, and here's another story about my parents. Uh, thank God they're still with us, hopefully for another 30 years. But one of the things that in the summer, because my parents didn't have a lot of money, we didn't have babysitters. So my babysitter, when I was starting, when I was in like the second grade, so I was like, I don't know, eight, seven years old, I don't know. I would go to work with my dad in the summers. My dad was a janitor for a mega church. And every single day we would drive to Norwalk, California, or Hawaiian Gardens, and we would drive back home, and it was more than an hour each way because we were driving against tra with traffic. And every single day, my dad would turn on his talk radio, and I hated that talk radio because it was like nothing I cared about. It was like doctors and psychologists and radio and who knows what else. But it began to, like, soothe me. When my brother was old enough to buy a car, every time we would go in his car, he would listen to talk radio. When I finally started driving, I started to listen to talk radio. As a 40, almost 42-year-old man, I like listening to podcasts and audiobooks and YouTube because it became a part of who I am. I love music, but I like talk. So one of the things I do is I'll, I'll go on YouTube oftentimes. I love YouTube because it has all kinds of different options. And on any given day, I'll listen to a comedian or I'll listen to like a true crime podcast or I'll listen to real stories and stuff like that. I just like that kind of stuff. And one of the things I used to do, and here's where this begins to matter. So I can remember years ago, I would listen to sermons every single day. Not because I was righteous, I just enjoyed it. 
I used to go to sleep listening to sermons. I used to wake up listening to sermons. I would listen to sermons all the time and I loved it. Over the years though, with the advent of YouTube and all of these other things, I would start listening to other things. None of it bad. So a couple of weeks ago, I was like, you know what? I haven't listened to a good sermon in a while. I mean, I've had church sermons here, but I mean, I haven't listened to anything like on a Tuesday. And so I went and I found a sermon that I thought would be good and, and I, And I was about to press play and I was like, oh, but I really want to hear what's happening in the news. I really want to hear about this thing that was happening in Congress. I really want to know what's happening with, right? And I I was talking myself out of listening to a sermon. Press play anyway. And then when I got done after this 54 minute sermon, I was like, I want more. I'm hungry for more. And so I listen to another one and another one and another one. And I'm starting to go to sleep now with sermons on in my ears. But I got to tell you that making that first decision, and I'm not saying that sermons is it for everyone. For some of you, it's, it's, it's worship music and you get the same. For some of you, it might be reading the word, which I hope you're all reading the word every single day. But what I realized was happening within me is that I had let myself go on autopilot. I, but fam, I still read my Bible every single morning, just so you know, most mornings. Sometimes I wake up too late. But you know, I'm still doing my Bible study. I'm still doing all the stuff you would expect the pastor to do. But listening to those sermons, I, I began to realize that the Spirit had been working on me, washing over me, wooing me back into the point now where I'm looking, I'm creating a playlist so that I can know what's the next sermon that I'm gonna listen to because of what it's doing in my soul. It's the little adjustments, the little changes that you make to show up to the presence of God that will make the biggest change in your life. It's not that you're doing it. Your job is simply to be open to the fact that the Spirit can actually move in your life. Jesus says the Spirit, the Spirit of God, it moves wherever it wants to. I will do what I want to when I want to. You have to be open to show up to the presence of God. And so Nicodemus... Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night because John wanted us. He, he, John could have left that detail out. But John, in the Gospel of John, there's always something deeper that is going on. There's the surface level, and then there's the deeper. And, and, and what John was referring to Nicodemus coming at night was that Nicodemus was blind. He was blind. He had all of the right answers. He had gone to church his whole life, but he was blind, and he was hungry because he was wanting something deeper that he knew could only come from the presence of Jesus. The gospel is going from being blind to now you can see. The gospel is that you take your darkness and you allow the light of Jesus to illuminate your life. The gospel is you going from death to life. To be born from above or to be born again means that there is a version of yourself that has to die. To be able to experience rebirth means that you must experience a death in your life before Jesus can resurrect you into the newness of life. What are the things in your life that you have to put to death? What are those sins in your life that have been holding you back? What are the mindsets and the attitudes and the failures? What are those narratives in your mind that you have to put to death so that Jesus can create a new life in you? I hope you struggle with that this week. I hope you struggle with asking, God, what needs to die in me so I can experience the cleansing of water and spirit in my life? Because the goal of everything in life is for you to be drawn closer to the heart of God so that you can then reflect his love and glory. Your purpose in life isn't your job. Your purpose in life isn't your family. Your purpose in life isn't riches and success. Your purpose in life is to be a witness to the love of Jesus. So whether you are a high-powered attorney or like my father, a janitor, Your purpose is to be a witness wherever you are. And you can do that in any part of your life. And it begins at home. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that your spirit would wash over every person in this place. 
that even those who didn't want to be here today, Father, that your spirit might disrupt their souls in a way that they know that there is something more that they are longing for. Father, we simply lift up our hearts, our minds, our souls to you now. May your spirit continue the long wooing in our lives that you would never forsake us. In the loving name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.